Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining Mark, Jason, and myself for today's discussion on how organizations can leverage object storage to accelerate their businesses. I'll let Mark and Jason introduce themselves in a minute, but before we get started, I wanted to provide some context on why Kemp and Della are running this joint session today. For those of you who haven't heard, there's been a long-standing partnership between Kemp and Dell Technologies, and as part of the working relationship, Kemp has developed a low balancing solution specific for Elastic Cloud Storage, or also known as ECS. We'll hear more about the details in the next hour, but um, first, wanted to make sure we go over some basic housekeeping items. You are all in listen-only mode. However, we'd love to hear from you, so please feel free to submit any questions you may have, and we'll be sure to address them at the end of the discussion. Um, please take a note that there are a number of resources available for you under the tab called Attachments. So I would just spend a couple minutes to, to check them out throughout the presentation. And finally, if you missed parts of the discussion or if you just need a refresh, you can view the webcast anytime after the session ends. With that, let me turn it over to Mark and Jason. Take it away, guys. Thanks a lot, uh, Noemi. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, excited to be here today. Uh, Mark, you want to give a bit of an introduction uh, for yourself? Sure. Hi, folks. Uh, Mark Herrera. I'm one of the global field CTOs with Dell Technologies, and I'm focus focusing on object storage. So it's been about 10 years, started with Atmos, now UCS, and been working with Jason and team over at Kemp for a number of years, and it's you know a fantastic partnership. So looking forward to the conversation today. Excellent, excellent. I'm Jason Dover, Vice President of Product Strategy uh, here at Kemp Technologies. So I lead the overall direction of our product portfolio, uh, working closely with product management, uh, marketing, as well as key partnerships such as those with uh, Dell Technologies. And uh, yeah, really, really excited, Mark, to get together and do this session together. Like, like you mentioned, we've been working together for a bit, and uh, really cool to, to come and connect and chat about our solutions that we have together the partnership and ultimately how we help customers with highly available and scalable object storage for a variety of applications and ultimately that infrastructure is there to serve their, their business needs. Um, I think it's worth just setting a bit of context for the audience, right? You know, you, you guys have obviously been innovating quite a bit and really I would say disrupting the space of object storage. Uh, with your unique approach to handling unstructured data as a whole, right? And, and Kemp as an application mm -hmm. delivery controller vendor, we're providing front-end proxying, load balancing, and uh, DNS-based distribution services for resilient multi-cluster and multi-site scenarios. I mean, I, I think it's just worth noting that as has always been the case, having the right data in the right place at the right time is super critical. You know, it's, it's kind of the historical challenge, even if you rewind back to when cloud migration started to become the du jour, right? I, I can move the front ends for my application stack around easily, but the key challenge is making sure that I've got data locality right for that actually to work. And, and, and that backdrop just highlights how important it is for storage to be in the right place and just how fundamental it is uh, to modern to modern infrastructure. Now, the, the the kind of crossover for us is obviously that when you're looking at object storage, it, it leverages modern cloud-centric protocols that operate over IP transport, and that's where load balancing comes in, right? We we come into play of working together because from a network perspective, ECS, your object storage offering, it looks and behaves like an application as opposed to just this storage plumbing that's under the hood you don't have to worry about. So I thought it was just relevant to kind of set the context of, of how Kemp and Dell Tech come together when we're talking about object storage. And with that, what we'll cover today, uh, we're going to try to get these five things done in the next 45 minutes to an hour or so. So, so we've got that backdrop. We've got that context. Um, I think it's relevant to get a feel for what are the drivers that are influencing the decisions people are making today when it comes to their storage strategy? Uh, another relevant question to answer is, well, what is object storage actually, and why should we care? What are the use cases and scenarios where it's specifically relevant? There's 
a lot of approaches that folks can take when it comes to storage. Why should object storage be a part of their overarching strategy? Uh, diving in a little bit to understand Dell Technologies and your unique approach to it. Uh, why Dell Tech versus the myriad of other offerings that are out there. We'll dig in a little bit more to how we're working together. And finally, if we were to kind of give the listeners a, a playbook for Monday morning, if they're evaluating bringing object storage into their ecosystem, what might that playbook look like? Uh, so, so getting started, I guess a, a question to you, Mark. Uh, maybe just dive in a bit. What are some of the business drivers that are leading to the decisions people are making uh, about their storage strategy in July 2020? Yeah, thanks, thanks Jason. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, as, as I travel the, the world and, and now mostly virtual <laughs> with COVID, you know, the, the common themes keep coming up. And this isn't a, you know, a today issue. I think it's been going on. So when we think of object storage, uh, just to kind of identify the types of data, it's, it's all unstructured, right? We're not thinking of structured database tables and things like that. It's um, collecting unstructured data. And what we're seeing, uh, or the trends have been, it's just the amount of data and the time that you keep it has been exploding. So just a tremendous amount of growth. And, and that's also being driven um, by just the number of sources that you're collecting. Um, we, we've kind of had user created documents, you know, files and spreadsheets, um, emails and attachments where we wanted to archive those. Now going to machine generated sensors and, and other devices that are forwarding logs to be stored and then eventually analyzed in the future. So certainly um, a big driver to how to efficiently store that data that's coming from many locations in one or, or multiple data centers and even think about how do I make that data accessible actively across both data centers and in and out of my data center? Makes, makes a lot of sense. I remember seeing some recent statistics, and, and depending on when you go and look, it goes up, but that there's something like 40 billion connected devices in, in the enterprise, yes. uh, 3.8 billion mobile users, and there were some estimates that in the, the not-so-distant future, we'd have one petabyte of data managed by each IT pro if, if we look at just the enterprise space. And equally, yeah. that 50% of enterprise data will require some level of metadata, which we'll dig into more. But of course, that, you know, it requires mm -hmm. an object storage approach. Like you mentioned, you've got IoT, smart devices, social, all of these things. There was another one that really blew my mind, but it was estimated that by the end of this year, we as a, as, a, as a people will be producing something like 44 zettabytes of data per year. And that, and that equates yeah. to 40 times more bytes than the stars in the observable universe. So yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's yeah. an overstatement to say there's an explosion yeah. of data, as, as you just highlighted. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was interesting when we first started, it was, you know, hundreds of millions of objects or pieces of data and petabytes. Um, of data, and now we're, we're kind of moving towards, um, you know, exabytes is kind of the, the new target. You know, there's probably a handful of customers that are there, but people are approaching hundreds of petabytes, certainly. And billions is, is really a common term that we see, and, you know, we have thousands of customers, and we we have optics into the amount of data that's being stored, and, you know, we, we often see, you know, many billions of objects stored. And then to your point, lots of metadata and key value, uh, custom applied metadata describing the data, that's also stored. So, you know, it's an interesting challenge, but it's a, it's a fun challenge as well for, for allowing customers to really capture more data and gain better insights uh, with that data. I mean, I think the amazing thing is just how quickly that's happened as well. I, I mm -hmm. used to work in IT uh, in the fintech space. And yeah, back then, you know, several terabytes of data was considered a lot, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whereas now that, that may be somewhat of a smallish type deployment. So it's amazing yeah. how quickly that's changed. And, and with yeah. that, you know, cost is certainly a big factor too. It, it costs to keep that data. Yeah. Just kind of going back to my experience, like I mentioned, we, 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 we really looked at cost closely when it came to storage. And it, it, yep. it was common then, it's still common now that you've got a, a multi-tier approach 
when you think about storage. So you're, if, you, if you're in finance, you're uh, critical systems and applications that are, are, are closely correlated to uh, to trading. Uh, that's going to be on your higher tier, more expensive storage, whereas perhaps archive and so forth may be on lower cost storage. Or uh, you may even, I remember we had our exchange databases split out where we had our uh, top execs who were on the most expensive mm -hmm. storage to make sure they had the, the best response time and, and the most IOPS. Whereas, uh, you know, other folks that at that time were my tier, we were, we were on the cheaper storage. Now, the interesting thing yeah. in spaces like that, as well as, as legal and, and healthcare, is that you've got to keep everything, it, potentially forever, depending on the country and regulations. But even if not forever, it could be 5, 7, 11 years. And this adds mm -hmm. up. Uh, th there was another estimate that suggested that the cost of storing a single terabyte of data is just shy of $3,600 per year. But that's not a full factor when you consider the supporting infrastructure, right? You, you may have to have WAN acceleration. You need redundancy. There's a lot of supporting tech that has to, has to go into supporting the storage of that data. And like you said, we're, we're talking about petabytes, not terabytes. How are you seeing costs play into, into customer decisions when it comes to storage? Yeah, so certainly cost is the and you know probably the leading um, decision make maker to bring object storage in, right? We're introducing something new, and you kind of have to offset some of the learning curve of now I have a new platform to manage, and you know certainly acquisition cost is is a big one, and you know I think um, Dell Tech and ECS have driven a lot of that cost out by making the solution software centric. We run on commodity parts, um, so we're not you know utilizing any ASICs or controllers and things like that. It's all built into the software. Um, but then, you know, density, uh, which drives floor tiles, power, heat, um, all those things do play into the total cost. And then certainly the one that we can't ever miss is the FTE time. So how do we manage these petabytes or hundreds of petabytes, maybe an exabyte with a few FTEs um, part-time, right? So the system's got to be intelligent. And a lot of our heritage uh, has been, you know, Developing and deploying these large systems, but we also, you know, acquired some talent from some of the the big hyperscalers that manage these cloud services that you know are, are thinking about things like automation, self-healing, self-provisioning, to really lower that cost. That you know, the, the calls coming into IT are limited to get the storage, to manage and maintain the storage, and you never want to say no. So, you know, giving having control like quotas. It's, it's critical, but we also want things like metering where if you say, hey, I, I want to give the business units the ability to store the data they want, but I want to be able to show back or charge back efficiently, but not do a lot of you know, hand-holding or management day-to-day -to, -day to ensure the system's running. Makes a lot of sense, and I think the interesting thing, too, is there's been a lot of customers that have looked to public cloud storage with the hope sure. of of reducing costs, but then have been yeah. disappointed after they've gotten to scale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. That you know, usually um, same thing. You know, um, we we compete often um, with uh, public clouds. I would say you know it's kind of a, a world we live in that uh, a hybrid model is likely going to be um, what people pick. Um, we often see people pick cloud because of the economics. I want to do something cheaper. It's out of my data center, but they quickly uh, realize that just parking data is not what most business units or line of business um, owners want. They're going to want to extract, you know, insights out of the data. They want to manipulate it, analyze it, and those those heavier or more sophisticated data services cost more. So their their bill is um, not only um, uh, variable throughout the months, where some months if someone's being really chatty or, or working the data a lot, they'll get a much higher bill. So it's hard to, to plan for the cost. And then the costs are higher than they typically see on the you know few cents per, per terabyte uh, uh, or per gig, sorry, um, that are, are advertised. So you quickly get into a cost that's more expensive on, in the cloud than on-prem. Yeah, and that's certainly an interesting challenge. I mean, we, we from, from the load balancing and application delivery side, we've got a, a, quite a number of options available to customers for variable billing. And, and what we 
find quite a bit is that there's a lot of customers that want to adopt that approach, but they just might not yet have the cost structures inside of their own environment for consuming technologies in that way. So yeah, that, that may be the direction that they want to go, but it may not actually be the right fit for them right at this moment. Mark and audience, I do apologize if you hear any background noise. This is really a live session. And uh, as it never fails, my neighbors have just started mowing their lawn. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll try to do some strategic muting, but you may hear a bit of a uh, lawn mowing going on in the, in the background. Gotcha. Yeah, I, guess I don't hear it yet, so you're, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I guess going to the next piece, uh, Mark, I, I hear a lot when people talk about storage and specifically object storage, uh, mm -hmm. how, how this plays into, I'm going to kind of merge the two together, but into increased sure. efficiency and also mm -hmm. helping uh, with the transition to the quote-unquote Shangri-La of a DevOps model inside of their environment. Can you maybe speak to how, how does yeah. that connect? How does storage connect with these two objectives? Yeah, so if you think of cost and efficiency, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so I'll talk to that. So uh, clearly, um, when you're new, introducing something new, you look for the, the lowest risk option, and that typically lends itself to archive or a tier of storage where my primary um, storage is something else that I'm used to running. I have a you know an archive engine, I'm pushing it down. Now, we know that these new types of data are, are generating just a variable um, amount of data that, you know, differ in sizes. So we're, we're seeing a lot, a lot of small data, but not just big data as a challenge anymore. So we need to be efficient for not only large data, but small data. Um, and, and a lot of that's kind of built into how you protect the data. But you also don't want to push too much of that back to the administrators or even the application owners to decide what policy they're going to pick. Do I mirror small data? Do I erasure code large, large data? You know, we, we've kind of thought everything should get erasure coding, and we have to do things internally to make that happen without impacting small data. Um, so that, that allows people to get a footprint in. And then that kind of feeds into what people really want to do. They want to build these next generation applications, so they're building up these DevOps teams, and they're thinking containers, um, web services um, that are accessed by APIs, and these are all things that a developer would think of. But the challenge is that they usually don't have the budget to start these projects. You know, the concept is usually going to have a thin margin, and you want to go on shared environments. So the, the beautiful thing that we're seeing is most people could fund the object store by lowering the cost of their traditional applications by putting a tier, an archive tier in, and because the, the concepts or the design of, of object storage lends itself to these next-gen applications where it scale out, um, WAN, local, you know, mobile app design um, is kind of, you know, first and foremost in, in the design principles. They're able to kind of give access to their developers, and then developers have, you know, total control. They can control their own, they can create their own buckets. They can protect the data through versioning. They could expire data through life cycles. All these things are, are the control of an API, and that's really um, the power of the API. If you, if you kind of limit the, anything you want to do, you have to go to an IT administrator. One, you're adding cost. Uh, you're adding time to, to make that uh, happen. And then two, because you're on a shared environment, you could you know, impact your production workload. So we really want to have this isolation and a very efficient um, product but really enable and empower the developers to go build these next-gen apps to really monetize the, the, the data or the, you know, the, the content that are, is managed by these applications to really drive you know, revenue and profit for the company. So it sounds like basically object storage can help through the entire life cycle, because, because I just highlighted. So I'm doing maybe some mm -hmm. experimentation, uh, I'm, I'm leveraging perhaps cloud native architectures. Well, your object storage infrastructure is built for that, as you mentioned, because the app devs themselves yeah. have direct access to the APIs. I'm lowering costs because there's not a huge storage administration overhead. But then once I get mm -hmm. to production of that ecosystem, well, well, I presume the value of object storage then comes down to its ability to be provisioned and scaled quickly, efficiently, and with cost controls around it. Yeah, yeah, and richness of the API, we want to give more capabilities to the developer to make choices on 
you know, how they protect their data, how they're going to um, expire their data, describing data um, that's in there through these key value pairs, it's all done through, you know, a data API. And that, that's really powerful. And that's, that's I think, uh, one of the explosions that happen in public cloud where people park their data, but then realize, geez, I could do a lot more than developing these applications that are written to take advantage of these scale-out architectures. I could do things in parallel. I could you know, control my data. I could retain my data so I can't delete it. You think about these financial services companies, that's critical, right? They, they don't want these voice recordings or these documents to, to be deleted accidentally before um, they legally can. So it's, it's, a, it's a great platform that's multi-use, and really the, the goal is to make it the most cost-effective. I hate the word cheap. It's the most cost-effective <laughs> product we believe that we put out. Makes sense. So you, now, you mentioned an interesting phrase earlier about monetizing the data, and, and we just scratched the surface barely when it came to metadata. Uh, I know analytics and, and insights are becoming more and more important. Even in our, our space, what we're finding is that customers have a core requirement, uh, regardless of, of what type of infrastructure or technology they're putting in, that the vendor provides them some ability to be able to capture insights and analytics that I can use to learn more about my customer, I can use to be, yeah. have a competitive edge against my competition, and as you said, to turn that data insight into actual revenue for, for the company. Maybe expand a little bit in terms of how storage and this factor overlap. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the great thing is, you know, um, object storage focuses on, you know, efficiently storing lots of data and making it accessible for APIs. If you think about analytics, whether it's operational analytics or a team, whether it's, you know, batch analytics, um, most of those projects started in the Apache uh, world where, you know, these, these smart um, fellows developed a, an application to, you know, consume the data inside of uh, these large repositories maybe HDFS to start with, but then, you know, a lot of the cloud started to extend that to also support object storage. So the, the uh, almost all of the frameworks, whether it's a, you know, commercially available Cloudera, Hortonworks, or it's just open source, you know, Apache and, and, and those projects do now support object storage to not only discover the data, you can store data and you could run batch analytics. And as, the um, knowledge has really increased. We're starting to see people um, extend beyond batch to more augmented analytics where we're starting to get, I wouldn't say real time because um, the, the performance may be out there, but if you think about, I'm starting to introduce some machine learning or deep learning um, concepts through Spark um, machine learning or other um, frameworks that do support S3. And you could start to do you know, training of models and then do some, you know, inference of uh, maybe not as performant um, uh, queries against the platform. And as vendors such as EMC start to introduce, um, I would say, more performant infrastructure like utilizing SSDs or NVMEs, we're starting to think about mixing uh, our, our common or traditional pool with a more performant pool to really extend what you can do with object storage. So really we want to store a bunch of data um, to save costs, but then um, also enable applications to write data primary, you know, primary storage for unstructured, and then gain insights on all of that data, whether it's archived from, uh, uh, you know, a primary application that's on something else, or, you know, an application that was developed directly to consume ECS, um, but, you know, be able to gain insights through these traditional SQL queries through Hive and Spark SQL and even Presto. Um, and then extend that up into more of the, you know, more automation with um, machine learning and deep learning. Excellent, excellent. Make, makes a lot of sense. I, I think this gives us a pretty good good backdrop in terms of what's kind of the, the underlying current that's leading people to reevaluate what they're doing with, with their storage infrastructure. This is good to kind of connect the dots on all of those areas. With that, I guess getting getting slightly technical for for just a moment or two, I think it is worth mm -hmm. just clearing up what is object storage, right? Uh, sure. you know, most enterprises have a variety of different storage ecosystems. They've got 
databases, they've got NFS shares, they've got some uh, legacy storage sitting on a desktop under the IT admin's desk. <laughs> it would be worth just mm -hmm. clarifying what is object storage, what isn't it, and what are sure. the types of, of use cases where you would adopt this storage approach versus some of the others. Sure. No, great, great question. So, yeah, so um, I guess we'll, we'll kind of start to kind of walk through a little bit. So if we think about structured data, you commonly think of block storage and, you know, tables, databases, and things like that, although a lot of them can support file systems as well. But, but block storage is going to be, um, you know, volumes or lungs that are presented up through either um, uh, a fiber channel fan or, you know, uh, an IP network that's presented in the volume. The, the servers themselves that are running the application own the file system and they mount the lines and, and they control. So it's kind of a, a one-to-one -one mapping in a sense. And then you, you could do some clustering, but you know, it's very controlled. Um, and and that, that's something that you know, object storage would never compete uh, in that market. But then if you think about unstructured data, you kind of have a choice in a sense. You have file system and object storage systems. And file systems, you know, are still lead the charge when you think about our traditional um, access methods like NFS and such. So that's, that's something that object storage will do, but not um, uh, well in a sense. It, it'll do it um, and provide you the ability to, to load data. But the, the thought is, we want to move towards uh, an API uh, accessible storage. You know, RESTful Nature, S3, Swift, what have you. Um, a, a file system does present the file system uh, at the storage layer, so you can have this concept of a multi-user environment. And there's some uh, file systems that are uh, kind of monolithic where it's active-passive or active-active across a, a few nodes. Or, you know, where Isilon shines uh, or PowerScale shines, it's a scaled file system, and it's fantastic. It gives you know a tremendous value to general purpose file system, but applications and, and certainly can move up the stack pretty quickly into you know AI with its you know multi uh, classes of storage. Now, object storage is similar in concept where it's a scaled architecture, but we kind of break the barriers of a of a data center to multiple data centers, and our clients are typically applications consuming the web services or the resources through a RESTful call. So we we kind of move away from I'm going to be the user and I'm going to authenticate and I'm going to use my SIFS or NFS uh, to get the data or put data in and then I'm going to use traditional ACL to manage. We're really kind of moving towards a an application that's going to consume the resources and they're going to build the scale capabilities into their application. Um, but we're we're trying to give them a benefit so I could get scale with higher, without hierarchy, so I don't have to worry about you know, having a well-defined hierarchy. I could have a, a bucket with petabytes of data, billions of objects, I don't care. That bucket can be accessible from any location, so I could have a distributed application or even clients that can load data from any location uh, and access that from many locations. Now, authentication is typically handled by the application layer, but as we start to see um, features come, uh, richer features come into object storage, you we're starting to see more control that could be put down into the object store that could limit what people could do, and not make silly mistakes in a sense. So if you think about object storage, it's scale uh, in a flat main space, multi-site, um, active active access, the ability to describe your data through custom metadata tags, so I don't have to read the full document to figure out that it's an important document that has, you know, it's, it's all about Dell technologies, um, and it, it's all uh, and it's a rich set of APIs that allow the application to not only consume the storage resources but control what they're doing in terms of protecting the data, replicating the data, expiring the data, and then even searching uh, these, these tags. Uh, to find uh, other objects that are related. I think that last point you mentioned is, is really powerful. Um, you know, my, my primary takeaway here is that, you know, block storage volumes, they, they can be accessed only when they're attached to an operating system. But object storage, which you're including both the object data and the metadata, it can be accessed directly through APIs and over HTTP. So it seems like just with that one simple fact, that it connects the application developer much, much more directly to the data 
and lowers the overhead for the storage administrator. Would that be a correct yeah. assumption as well? That that is, and if you think about most modern applications, they're they're not you know homogeneous in the sense where it's not one application; it's multiple applications working together. They're communicating through APIs. They might be running in different languages or even different operating systems. And the the power of a RESTful HTTP, um, HTTP API set is that they could all consume that without worrying. Oh my goodness, it's a Linux OS running a Java application, or it's a Windows running a .NET. They could communicate to each other through a set of APIs and through the storage through that same API. So think about the power that unlocks. I mean, you know, you work in financial services. Imagine capturing. Um, you know, transactions, running it through fraud detection, analytics, and then, you know, spitting out, a, you know, a, a statement at the end on a common infrastructure. That's, that's pretty powerful. Well, one other question in here. We find that object storage is, is, is associated quite a lot with public cloud. You probably will hear that uh, that nice lawnmower now in the, in the background, but <laughs> you find it with, you know, you've got Amazon S3, you've got Rackspace Cloud Files, Azure Blob, Google Cloud Storage, et cetera. There's a theme, right, that, that object storage connects with cloud. Maybe just can you add to that a little bit? Why is there an association with cloud apps and object storage? Yeah, so so certainly um, if you think of object storage in the cloud, you think of it's software. So they're buying commodity parts and they're they're building the software to run on those. So it's, it's a lower cost because they're they're going to be going after a very aggressive cost model. Two, they want to have a lot of automation and intelligence built in that software because you know if they're thinking of managing exabytes and hundreds of millions of consumers. Um, the, the software's got to be smart enough to do that. And then most of their customers were you know, outside of their data center, so they're accessing it over the Internet. Certainly, they do have the ability to run applications on other services. But, you know, a fair amount of S3 started where I've got a backup application that I want to put a secondary copy up in Amazon. Or I have an archive and I just want to reduce my footprint in my data center. So HTTP was really powerful. And of course, because they were a shared model, they didn't want to expose the uh, control over, you know, management set of APIs. So they wanted their managers to control, and then they wanted to start to grant access to the, the data users, you know, bucket owner, what have you, to do things with their data. I want to create a version of it. I want to lifecycle it. I want to tier it, what have you. So um, that's why you typically see um, uh, object storage in, in cloud to support many, many um, so, uh, consumers and, and even use cases. And what we, we see is that consumers start to use it um, initially because of the price point, and then they say, geez, there's a lot of value in being able to do this, and I don't have to be in the middle, and I'm an IT admin, and I'm the line of business owner. I want to consume that and gain more insights out of my data, but they want that on-prem. So that's where, you know, uh, Companies like Dell Technologies invested in the technology um, to give customers choice. I want to have that same experience that I would have in cloud, but on-prem. That includes operational efficiencies. That includes the economics. That includes the, the you know the efficient API that your developers own. Um, so it's not just I have to go to cloud to get these benefits of object storage. I could do it on-prem. Got it. It makes sense, and that's a perfect segue to to our next point we wanted to cover which is the Dell Technologies Advantage. Like we just highlighted there, you've got quite a number of options that's available from all of the, the hyperscale players and, and from other uh, cloud players. Even for, let's say, you're repatriating your data, you're bringing it back on premises, there's a number of options available there, and they range from you know software-centric, I bring my own hardware, to fixed solutions, et cetera. What would you say is Dell Technologies Advantage when it comes to object storage uh, as a whole? Yes, yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I think, you know, one, we, we've been doing it for a long time. It's you know, 16 plus years in the making. It's our third generation. And um, so, you know, we had to make some hard decisions to introduce a new generation platform. But, you know, the technology changes um, as you're developing these, these infrastructures. Um, Clearly, ECS was was right around the time where next generation concepts and containers were really kind of taking off. We took advantage of those. And that's hard to kind of go back and, and kind of change a, a pretty mature code line. Um, 
but you know we had um, a lot of uh, experience by going through those multiple generations, so we kind of carried those forward. Um, we also um, gained some insights from folks that we um, hired from uh, public cloud that kind of built these cloud, these large cloud concepts. And we put them in the room and said, okay, if we had to kind of build, uh, you know, a cloud on-prem that acted like a public cloud, but kind of thought through things that enterprise and IT would typically do. They're they're not software centric, so they're not coding directly. So the system's got to be, you know, bulletproof in a sense where it's not gonna. I don't have to go you know, troubleshoot my code and if I want a new feature, I just want to be able to click a button and it should do all the right things. And then it should do things on its own. If the drive fails, it needs to recover. If I um, select, a po select a policy on a namespace, anyone who creates a bucket should get that policy if it's encryption or compliance. So those are the things that, you know, we, we, we bring to the table in terms of just the general architecture and our experience. Uh, we, we adopted next gen architecture. So you know, day one, we were built on uh, containers. Uh, we are now refactoring that to add microservices and we're looking at um, running in Kubernetes as a, as a native uh, application. And that really unlocks a lot of things around true software defined, you know, having multiple object stores on a shared environment, being able to have the, the administrators deploy your own object stores, grow, upgrade, maybe even delete. Um, but we want to continue to ensure that we we make that enterprise grade. So, you know, ensuring that um, people don't get themselves in trouble when they're doing those things. Uh, and then the support model. So all of our software um, does dial home to the Dell technologies. We do a lot of fleet learning where we're looking at across our arrays to ensure that um, we're, we're looking for trends that can cause disruption, uh, performance issues. And then even better, you know, how do we improve the, the, the technology as we're deploying these microservices? We might want more of one and less of other microservices. So we're, we're really kind of learning and then applying that back to, um, to, to Apple, to the, the, the software stack so then consumers can then take advantage of that. A lot of that is automation. So, you know, again, people want self-service, but they want it automated. So I want to be able to do something, but I don't want... 16 clicks to deploy something. I want a few clicks. Um, and then obviously uh, maximizing deployment and flexibility. So but a lot of our customers are traditionalists. They want an appliance like field. So we're going to take the software. We're going to take our, our servers built on PowerEdge, um, Dell servers, and our networking built on you know, Dell networking, and then our, our load balancing, which is built on CAM, and then put that into a, a rack and then deliver that as an appliance. So end to end, all you're providing is floor space, power, and then uplink to your core network. But Dell Technologies supports the rest of it. Uh, we, we also have that model of software where if you want to provide those commodity parts um, dedicated, you certainly can do that. And with our .NET release coming out um, later this year, beginning of next year, you're going to see the software run on top of Kubernetes or inside of vSphere 7. So lots and lots of options for customers. So it's not one size fits all. They can start with one, they can adopt uh, and grow to another, or they can mix and match. And that's really um, a, a, a huge benefit, we believe, and, and you know, customers have, have given us the feedback that they do want that choice. And we'll continue to have that, that um, flexibility even as we go into a more of, you know, true software hyperconverged deployment option. Perfect. Yeah, it makes, makes sense. And I think another even value prop that we've seen of working with you guys is the fact that, you know, the object storage that you provide, it, it's a multi-use platform, right? The customers mm -hmm. can now consolidate their backup strategy, maybe get rid of tape. It can be a secondary storage tier. We already talked about DevOps. If I'm a service provider, this can be the backbone of my DR as a service offering. You've got legacy migration for protocol support for NFS. The, the list goes on and on. So, I can definitely see this, yeah. and we've been seeing how customers talk about this. I guess kind of switching gears a little bit, you know, we spoke earlier about the importance of data locality and reliability of the storage that I'm using to serve up my data to my applications. Maybe just talk a little bit, what have you guys done inside of your tech stack that helps customers to ensure they're going to have availability, resilience, and then ultimately be able to okay. scale and then we can bridge that to what the Kemp ECS connection manager does 
uh, for, for, for ECS on top of that? Yeah, no, that's not a great question. So, so certainly, uh, again, we're, our, our spirit is we will do as much as we can to offload things that the you know, application or developer has to do on their side. So, so um, as we deploy these nodes, um, you know, basically servers that are connected to the Ethernet within a location or cross location, once you um, connect to a node and you access the bucket, ECS kind of takes it from there. So it's going to ensure that the data is always protected locally across nodes and drives, so it can withstand a drive failure or a node failure. And then, you know, your choice, based on your replication policy, will replicate that data to another location. And then we make that accessible, obviously, active, actively across both. But then we're going to ensure that when, when it lands on that second site or, or two other sites or three other sites, what have you, we're going to project it again. Um, in that location, because the last thing you want to do is if I have a drive failure in a remote site, I don't want to have to pull data across. But we we all we also ensure site availability too. So if I do lose a site, um, I can um, access the data um, across the other site. You know, ensuring you obviously have to ensure that you have the the replication group set up. But you know, once you get to a node, we're going to kind of take it from there in terms of node drives and site availability. Um, but we do have to ensure that the client is doing the right thing and it's distributing um, its load across nodes and checking for the health of nodes um, and, and even, to your point, you know, deal with um, site locality. You know, you don't necessarily want to write all data, especially if it's small, across the country if there's something closer. But that's where we really will rely on the network and partners such as Kemp to kind of help the, the application on the network side do the smart thing because we know that, you know, uh, developer not necessarily is going to be thinking about the back end. He's going to be thinking about client access and control and, and, and the things that they should be thinking about, and we, we want to handle the rest. So, you know, kind of I could let you talk to, you know, your the value of Kemp, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice marriage between the, the availability inside of ECS once you get to the node, but certainly we need some intelligence before we get there. Yeah, it, 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 that makes a lot of sense. I think, uh, like I mentioned at the at the beginning, you know, ECS in terms of how it behaves on the network, it looks and behaves like like an IP based application. And you know, most IP based applications are going to need some sort of intelligent proxying and front ending. I mean, you think you go to your Gmail just as an example, right? You, you as the user or the app that's accessing your Gmail doesn't have to be concerned about you know, which server, which node, which cluster you're connecting into, or the location or IP address of that termination endpoint. That's essentially what the function of our Kemp ECS Connection Manager does for ECS, right? By, by front-ending the ECS ecosystem, serving as the termination endpoint, and then making intelligent decisions about how traffic gets distributed across that ecosystem, it, it adds quite a bit of simplicity and it also now makes horizontal scaling a lot easier as well. Um, I think you mentioned earlier about the, the, the global namespace as well, which simplifies things quite a bit. So I can have ECS clusters distributed in, in a single site, perhaps across uh, uh, multiple sites, while another kind of core feature of our product set is to be able to leverage DNS for traffic distribution across that ecosystem. And it also works in harmony with some of the, the capabilities that you have. We'll have kind of a deeper dive technical session at, at some other point, but when you think about XOR and being able to make intelligent decisions about routing client requests, right? When I go back to retrieve an object, making sure that I actually go back to the part of the ECS ecosystem that owns that object, well, that leads to efficiency by cutting down on traffic that has to go across site, perhaps over a slower WAN. Well, when you think about the GSLB functionality of a load balancer, that plays into it also. Um, I know something we've seen in yeah. a lot of recent customer cases as well is the adoption of, of IPv6, specifically when it comes to some of our joint banking customers, uh, some of our federal customers, and so forth. So having an end-to-end -end stack that supports IPv6, uh, whether it needs to be translated or just to have a full IPv6 stack across the storage and the front end, that's been another uh, value prop that we've, we've built together. And the last piece I say is optimization, right? So something that plays with any application, and, and ECS is no different, is that 
a load balancer oftentimes is an ideal place to consolidate your SSL certificates, and it's oftentimes a good place to do the termination and the handshaking and all that goes into handling uh, TLS traffic flows, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. oftentimes yeah. in hardware, right? I mean, in our hardware appliances, you've got dedicated compute whose sole job is to do just that, <laughs> handle SSL transactions. Yeah. That then frees up mm -hmm. the back-end storage to do what it's best at, which is efficient storage and writing and serving up uh, storage yeah. requests. Now, you may have mm -hmm. cases where you need end-to-end -end encryption, and we can support that too. You can terminate the, the SSL traffic, decrypt it, perhaps add some optimization and repackage it, re-encrypt it, and send it to the back end, uh, which you might see yeah. in some of those environments that we talked about. But when you kind of couple those things together, you've got a really, really rock solid, highly available, resilient platform because you're doing, you're adding those things in at the network layer, and that's really just mm -hmm. complementing what's already being done inside of the storage as well. And when you put these two things together, you've got something that you can really rely on for all those scenarios that we spoke about already. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, that's, that, that's the beauty of it. Right? We, we made a conscious decision not to try to recreate networking or load balancing because <laughs> there was a lot of people that were doing it really well and most customers have that. But having that tight integration, and to your point, there's a lot of options that we can do around efficient data placement and data um, uh, pull, uh, read um, for, like you said, XOR with multi-site, um, having SSL termination, IPv6 translation. There's, there's just endless amount of things that we, we can gain benefits from with this combined solution. So it's, again, it's, it's a great partnership and I think customers are, are able to, to, to see that when we, we get an opportunity to talk to them. Absolutely. You know, as we went through the discussion, we've, we've kind of touched on a lot of the, the common use cases and verticals. Uh, you know, with my mm -hmm. own background, we've spoken about financial services quite a bit. We talked about DevOps. Yeah. We talked about analytics. One I did want to key in on specifically, uh, I know we've seen a lot of joint customers that we've worked with together in the pharma and life sciences space. Uh, maybe you want to just speak to why is that a key vertical for object storage and what's the particular driver in that specific environment that lends itself to, to object storage? Yeah, so, you know, we've had, uh, obviously, early success in financial services, but we another another vertical, as you said, is, is our life sciences. Um, I, I'm based in Boston, so I tend to talk to a lot of our pharmaceutical customers close, and, you know, we've, we've done a great job. So the, the one thing we obviously see, like any, any other um, industry, is that more data is being generated. The, the type and quality of data is driving just bigger content um, that needs to be stored. I would say probably next gen uh, genomic sequencing is probably our, our, our leading creator of content, um, where certainly um, you know, processing it on iPhone is, is fantastic. But you quickly want to move that somewhere so you, you make room for the next run. Um, and then being able to do, you know, high performance computing where um, iPhone is um, kind of a working storage. You kind of pull some of the data into, um, you know, scratch space where you, you kind of run some analytics. But, and then, but then you want to archive the data. And, you know, traditionally tape environments were used where you had some type of HSM software that could uh, move, the, move the data to tape. And, you know, quickly how to um, scale up your libraries to, to have more tapes inside of the library, and then cross-site was an issue. So we're, we're seeing a, a tremendous um, request where I've got multiple data centers I want to deploy global name space. I'm also partnering with other life science organizations. Um, we're seeing that today where you know, people are, are joining up to try to build a vaccine and they want to share some data. So having object storage that is accessible from, from multiple locations seems to be a, another big driver. So um, certainly just the type and size, the amount of data, um, they want to keep it longer, uh, they want it accessible from, from more than one location, and they want to you know, also share that data with their, their partners. I think that's actually a perfect bridge to one of the, the customer cases we wanted to, to chat about briefly. You know, we've spoken about a lot of interesting things as we get into the home stretch, but kind of connecting this to 
the reality, the abstract of the reality of what customers were doing. Uh, we had that one customer that we worked with earlier in the year, pharmaceutical leader, global, as you mentioned, and they were looking to optimize their global cloud storage. You know, obviously with, with current events, this is definitely a, a space that's really getting taxed these days. And if we look at what they were doing, I mean, 10 to 15 terabytes of data generated and stored daily from the research that they were doing. Uh, they needed that to always be accessible for various compliance and research reasons. They need to keep it effectively forever. And they also had security requirements like we spoke about with end-to-end -end encryption and so forth. Um, and if I just kind of recall the drivers of why we were successful in helping them, uh, they were multifold. But the things we spoke about earlier, they had some flex, they, they needed form factor flexibility across using some of their own storage, uh, using virtual as well as hardware centric offerings. And they wanted to ensure they were getting something that was unified, right? They didn't have to kind of piecemeal mm -hmm. it, put it together themselves. They wanted to go to one vendor and know that all of the pieces, even the commodity pieces, was coming. You know, that, that phrase we hear a lot, the one throat to choke was really important for them. Uh, but I think that just yeah. kind of highlights exactly what you were saying. Uh, there was another interesting one. I think this was just in the last couple of months, a, a global sports media organization that we worked with. And, and for them, a big part of their IP is their archive data from previous uh, sporting events and so forth that they have. That data needs to be able to be called on dynamically, right? If, if marketing's putting together some sort of campaign, some sort of event, the last thing they want to do is have to go and open a support ticket for a tape to get called or for a volume to be loaded for them to then be able to have access to that. They need real-time access. Uh, the other interesting thing, like we spoke about earlier with the data explosion, this was the definition of that. Uh, over the next 18 to 24 months, they were expecting exponential growth because they were moving to 4K as their standard high definition uh, medium. Yeah. So just a couple of examples. And, and we can really see how object storage and how what you know, Dell and Kemp are, are doing uh, really plays into a variety of real world scenarios for, for customers. I guess as as we kind of get into the home stretch and, and, and get to wrap up and, and leave a couple minutes for questions, uh, it, it's worth just reflecting or kind of re-highlighting uh, the partnership and, and the joint solution that we've brought uh, together. You know, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, I'd say, application load balancing, DNS-based GSLB multi-site load balancing are going to be absolutely critical for successful object storage deployments. And for this reason, we've sought to make this as easy as possible for customers to consume with our validated solutions, reference architectures uh, that we have from real world scenarios working with customers and really packaging that together in a singular and unified experience. I, I think my takeaway is that's what customers really appreciate about what we've been doing together. Uh, anything to add on that, Mark? Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think if you think about all our horizontal use cases, they're typically driven by an application um, that's packaged uh, if you're not developing it. And one of the, the big asks from customers is we want, you know, a fully tested, validated solution uh, to, to meet that requirement. And we've done done a lot of that over the years, you know, especially starting with Contero, over 300 ISVs that we bring in to validate. And the one great thing is we're using uh, Connection Manager in our in our uh, solutions lab to do end to end. So we're testing the application through Kemp uh, to ECS. So when you when you buy the solution, you know you're, you should feel comfortable that it's been vetted out. Perfect. And I, I guess lastly, uh, Mark, let's put ourselves kind of in the shoes of the the customer for for a minute. I fit into one of the scenarios or use cases that we've spoken about um, on the storage admin or, or even an, an application or practice owner, and I'm looking to build more efficiency in my environment. I'm looking to potentially move to a DevOps model, et cetera, or perhaps I'm looking to extract additional analysis. If we were to give our listeners kind of a Monday morning playbook of how they start exploring bringing object storage into the fold, what what would that playbook look like? Yeah, so I think I think you outlined it great. So you you know, as an account team, we need to identify an opportunity, um, or you know, if you're a customer, and you brought that to us. 
when we want to connect with the Dell Technologies account uh, rep, who is the quarterback in a sense, would bring in the, the, the subject matter expertise. Now, if we determine that object storage was the, the right choice, you know, we've, we could go, um, you know, start as simple as we want to give you access to an online environment or test drive uh, with, with virtual camp. Um, we want to actually now bring it in and do a POC on-prem, which we've done uh, before. And then that would help the account team not only validate the solution that was designed, um, and then, you know, obviously a procurement, it would be a single um, purchase order to Dell Technologies for, for both components, connection manager and the ECS component. Uh, the, the professional services team would go and install uh, the, uh, the system. And then again, uh, through support, we would work with the uh, you know, partnership with Kemp. If it was a connection manager issue, but certainly, you know, ECS, they would uh, man you know, manage and uh, support, uh, and, uh, or not manage, but support end to end uh, if there was any issue. Makes sense. Sounds nice and easy. And, and we've got some resources noted right here, as well as within the, the platform that we're doing the webinar on. So feel free to check those out, and, and you'll learn quite a bit more about how we're working together to help customers with object storage. Mark, this has been really fantastic. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and I, I, I can't wait till we uh, get to do this again. Yeah, no, I echo that. It's been a great partnership. We've got some great customer wins, as you kind of highlighted. I, I think that the pipeline is growing, and it's really a you know a tribute to the the team that works hard, and you know we we kind of act as one team uh, internally and in front of the customers, and I think the that that's um, driving a lot of the success. So I, I appreciate your time. It was a great great conversation. Great questions, by the way. <laughs> so thank you, and I look forward to the next one. Very cool. And looks like we were successful in actually covering all five topics in under 60 minutes, although barely, <laughs> but we did it. Uh, yeah. Back over to you, Noemi. Right. Yes, no, excellent discussion, guys. Um, thank you both for the amazing session. This is really, really helpful. I'm not sure about the rest of the attendees, but for me it was really helpful to learn about the business drivers and the challenges before getting into the weeds of object storage and also love the Monday morning playbook notion. I'm sure end users can appreciate the pragmatic approach just as much as I did. So really, really great discussion. So we do have a few more minutes for questions. Those of you who haven't submitted their questions yet, please take the time to type it in, and if we don't have the time to cover it now, we'll be sure to reach back out to you in an email or, or give you a phone call, and, um, and, um, and we'll be sure to address them. I see a couple really good ones already, so let's take a quick look and discuss. All right, here's a great one on some vertical use cases. So federal government customers have a variety of compliance requirements, for example, IPv6 or FIPS. Do the solutions discussed address these? Great question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great a great question. Maybe I'll, I'll start it from the Kemp side, and then Mark, if you can add from the the Dell Tech side. But uh, yeah, the federal space for Kemp is a, a key area of concern, um, and and we do have some dedicated focus on it from a, a pre-sales, from a sales, and and for even from a product management perspective to address the unique requirements that that folks in that. Uh, space apps. We spoke as an example earlier already about IPv6, which we're starting to see uh, more requirements uh, for uh, from our customers. Uh, we happen to have in our product some capabilities uh, for FIPS compliancy as well. 140-2 uh, level 1 or 2 oftentimes come into play when customers are looking at networking to make sure that you're using FIPS approved algorithms and methods and keys when you're dealing with the uh, secure keys associated with, with SSL. Uh, so those are just a couple of things, and we've got in our roadmap as well a number of other uh, capabilities and things that we're, we're looking at. We're on various approved product lists. Uh, we have done quite a bit of, of work with uh, various agencies to get on to STIGs so that we can be approved for uh, so deployment on, on secret networks and so forth. So certainly, uh, as, as that hopefully highlights, uh, the federal space uh, is certainly one uh, that's really important for Kemp, and we've been working on a number of capabilities to address the unique needs in that space. 
Great. Thanks, Jason. And uh, yes, I, um, I I know I've, I've been seeing quite a few federal customers um, in the pipeline and then and some close deals too. So definitely we're, we're making some good traction um, jointly with Dell on that. Um, Mark, before we jump onto the next question, was there anything you wanted to add to Jason's answer? Yeah, no, I think Jason covered it pretty well. I mean, certainly both both products have to go through when interpreting what uh, federal uh, sure. accounts need, and then you know applying the technology. So you know we also have to ensure that um, they work together because that's that's another requirement. So I think we we've done a, a great job of winning some key um, customers. We're going to continue to um, add support for some of some of the requirements and to hopefully build that pipeline. Excellent. And I know um, we are um, running out of time. So just real quick, I wanted to take this other one because it's another excellent question that came in. If my team already has a low bouncer solution, is it still worth evaluating DCS Connection Manager for investigating adoption of ECS object storage? So maybe Jason, if you could take this one real quick and then I'll let, let, let everyone go. Yeah, I'll take that one. And and the answer is unequivocally yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> Especially as we highlighted towards the end of the, the discussion, um, we've done quite a bit of work to make sure that it's an integrated stack, an integrated solution, and that things are going to be working together. Um, even looking at uh, our, our release roadmaps to make sure that we're in lockstep with what's happening on the storage side. The, the worst thing that you know, IT admins wind up facing is that they've got a complex uh, multi-vendor, perhaps best of breed infrastructure, right? Uh, but there's one update, there's one change in one part of the stack, and it hasn't been considered how that's going to impact the rest. Uh, with ECS Connection Manager being deployed in front of and alongside of, of ECS, that's something you're never going to have to worry about. So yes would be the answer there. Great, and I know we, we ran a little bit over, so I'll let everyone go. Thank you so much for both of you again for the fantastic overview. This was super, and uh, thanks for all the attendees to join again. You can always uh, revisit this uh, session by logging back to Bright Talk and wishing everyone a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot, Thanks, folks. everyone.